Section 27 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 27 The Ghost of Sakura, Part 3. As month after month passed away, towards the fourth year of the period Shoho, the wife of my lord Kotsuke no Suke, being with child, was seized with violent pains, and retainers were sent to all the different temples and shrines to pray by proxy, but all to no purpose. She continued to suffer as before. Towards the end of the seventh month of the year, there appeared every night a preternatural light above the lady's chamber. This was accompanied by hideous sounds as of many people laughing fiendishly, and sometimes by piteous wailings, as though myriads of persons were lamenting. The profound distress caused by this added to her sufferings. So her own privy counsellor, an old man, took his place in the adjoining chamber and kept watch. All of a sudden, he heard a noise as if a number of people were walking on the boards of the roof of my lady's room. Then there was a sound of men and women weeping. And when, thunderstruck, the counsellor was wondering what it could all be, there came a wild burst of laughter, and all was silent. Early the following morning, the old women who had charge of my lady's household presented themselves before my lord Kotsuke no Suke and said, Since the middle of last month, the waiting women have been complaining to us of the ghostly noises by which my lady is nightly disturbed, and they say that they cannot continue to serve her. We have tried to soothe them by saying that the devils should be exorcised at once, and that there was nothing to be afraid of. Still we feel that their fears are not without reason, and that they really cannot do their work. So we beg that your lordship will take the matter into your consideration. This is a passing strange story of yours. However, I will go myself tonight to my lady's apartments and keep watch. You can come with me. Accordingly, that night, my lord Kotsuke no Suke sat up in person. At the hour of the rat, midnight, a fearful noise of voices was heard, and Sogoro and his wife, bound to the fatal crosses, suddenly appeared, and the ghosts, seizing the lady by the hand, said, We have come to meet you. The pains you are suffering are terrible, but they are nothing in comparison with those of the hell to which we are about to lead you. At these words, Kotsuke no Suke, seizing his sword, tried to sweep the ghosts away with a terrific cut, but a loud peal of laughter was heard, and the visions faded away. Kotsuke no Suke, terrified, sent his retainers to the temples and shrines to pray that the demons might be cast out, but the noises were heard nightly as before. When the eleventh month of the year came around, the apparitions of human forms in my lady's apartments became more and more frequent and terrible, all the spirits railing at her and howling out that they had come to fetch her. The women would all scream and faint, and then the ghosts would disappear amid yells of laughter. Night after night this happened, and even in the daytime, the visions would manifest themselves, and my lady's sickness grew worse daily, until in the last month of the year she died, of grief and terror. Then the ghost of Sogoro and his wife crucified would appear day and night in the chamber of Kotsuke no Suke, floating round the room, and glaring at him with red and flaming eyes. The hair of the attendants would stand on end with terror, and if they tried to cut at the spirits, their limbs would be cramped, and their feet and hands would not obey their bidding. Kotsuke no Suke would draw the sword that lay by his bedside, but as often as he did so, the ghosts faded away, only to appear again in a more hideous shape than before, until at last, having exhausted his strength and spirits, even he became terror-stricken. The whole household was thrown into confusion, and day after day, mystic rites and incantations were performed by the priests over braziers of charcoal, while prayers were recited without ceasing. But the visions only became more frequent, and there was no sign of their ceasing. After the fifth year of Shoho, the style of the years was changed to Keian, and during the first year of Keian, the spirits continued to haunt the palace, and now they appeared in the chamber of Kotsuke no Suke's eldest son, surrounding themselves with even more terrors than before. And when Kotsuke no Suke was about to go to the shogun's castle, 
they were seen howling out their cries of vengeance in the porch of the house. At last, the relations of the family and the members of the household took counsel together and told Kotsuke no Suke that without doubt no ordinary means would suffice to lay the ghosts. A shrine must be erected to Sagoro, and divine honors paid to him, after which the apparitions would assuredly cease. Kotsuke no Suke, having carefully considered the matter and given his consent, Sogoro was canonized under the name of Sogo Daimyo, and a shrine was erected in his honor. After divine honors had been paid to him, the awful visions were no more seen, and the ghost of Sogoro was laid forever. In the second year of the period Keian, on the eleventh day of the tenth month, on the occasion of the festival of first lighting the fire on the hearth, the various daimyos and hatamotos of distinction went to the castle of the shogun at Yedo to offer their congratulations on this occasion. During the ceremonies, my lord Hota Kotsuke no Suke and Sakai Iwami no Kami, lord of the castle of Matsumoto in the province of Shinshu, had a quarrel, the origin of which was not made public. And Sakai Iwami no Kami, although he came of a brave and noble family, received so severe a wound that he died on the following day at the age of 43. And in consequence of this, his family was ruined and disgraced. My lord Kotsuke no Suke, by great good fortune, contrived to escape from the castle and took refuge in his own house, whence, mounting a famous horse called Hira Abumi, he fled to his castle of Sakura in Shimosa, accomplishing the distance, which is about sixty miles in six hours. When he arrived in front of the castle, he called out in a loud voice to the guard within to open the gate, answering in reply to their challenge that he was Kotsuke no Suke, the lord of the castle. The guard, not believing their ears, sent word to the counselor in charge of the castle, who rushed out to see if the person demanding admittance were really their lord. When he saw Kotsuke no Suke, he caused the gates to be opened, and thinking it more than strange, said, Is this indeed you, my lord? What strange chance brings your lordship hither thus late at night, on horseback and alone, without a single follower? With these words he ushered in Kotsuke no Suke, who in reply to the anxious inquiries of his people as to the cause of a sudden appearance said, You may well be astonished. I had a quarrel today in the castle at Yedo with Sakai Iwami no Kami, the lord of the castle of Matsumoto, and I cut him down. I shall soon be pursued, so we must strengthen the fortress and prepare for an attack. The household, hearing this, were greatly alarmed, and the whole castle was thrown into confusion. In the meanwhile, the people of Kotsuke no Suke's palace at Yedo, not knowing whether their lord had fled, were in the greatest anxiety, until a messenger came from Sakura, and reported his arrival there. When the quarrel inside the castle of Yedo and Kotsuke no Suke's flight had been taken cognizance of, he was attained of treason, and soldiers were sent to seize him, dead or alive. Mizuno Setsu no Kami and Goto Yamato no Kami were charged with the execution of the order and sallied forth on the thirteenth day of the tenth month to carry it out. When they arrived at the town of Sasai, they sent a herald with the following message. Whereas Kotsuke no Suke killed Sakai Iwami no Kami inside the castle of Yedo and has fled to his own castle without leave, he is attained of treason, and we, being connected with him by ties of blood and of friendship, have been charged to seize him. The herald delivered this message to the counselor of Kotsuke no Suke, who, pleading as an excuse that his lord was mad, begged the two nobles to intercede for him. Goto Yamato no Kami upon this called the counselor to him and spoke privately to him after which the latter took his leave and returned to the castle of Sakura. In the meanwhile, after consultation at Yedo, it was decided that, as Goto Yamato no Kami and Mizuno Setsu no Kami were related to Kotsuke no Suke and might meet with difficulties for that very reason, two other nobles, Ogasawara Iki no Kami and Nagaihida no Kami, should be sent to assist them, with orders that should any trouble arise, they should send a report immediately to Yedo. In consequence of this order, the two nobles with five thousand men were about to march for Sakura on the fifteenth of the month when a messenger arrived from that place bearing the following dispatch for the Goroju from the two nobles who had preceded them. In obedience to the orders of His Highness the Shogun, we proceeded on the thirteenth day of this month to the castle of Sakura and conducted a thorough investigation of the affair. It is true that Kotsuke no Suke has been guilty of treason, 
but he is out of his mind. His retainers have called in physicians, and he is undergoing treatment by which his senses are being gradually restored, and his mind is being awakened from its sleep. At the time when he slew Sakai Iwami no Kami, he was not accountable for his actions, and will be sincerely penitent when he is aware of his crime. We have taken him prisoner, and have the honor to await your instructions. In the meanwhile, we beg by these present to let you know what we have done. Sign. Goto Yamato no Kami, Mizuno Setsu no Kami, to the Goroju, second year of Keian, second month, fourteenth day. This dispatch reached Yedo on the sixteenth of the month, and was read by the Goroju after they had left the castle. And in consequence of the report of Kotsuke no Suke's madness, the second expedition was put a stop to, and the following instructions were sent to Goto Yamato no Kami and Mizu no Setsu no Kami. With reference to the affair of Hota Kotsuke no Suke, lord of the castle of Sakura in Shimosa, whose quarrel with Sakai Iwami no Kami within the castle of Yedo ended in bloodshed. For this he and his crime in disregard of the sanctity of the castle, it is ordered that Kotsuke no Suke be brought as a prisoner to Yedo, in a litter covered with nets, that his case may be judged. Second year of Keian, second month. Signed by the Goroju. Inaba Mino no Kami. Inoye Kawachi no Kami. Kato Echiyu no Kami. Upon the receipt of this dispatch, Hota Kotsuke no Suke was immediately placed in a litter covered with a net of green silk and conveyed to Yedo, strictly guarded by the retainers of the two nobles, and having arrived at the capital, was handed over to the charge of Akimoto Tajima no Kami. All his retainers were quietly dispersed, and his empty castle was ordered to be thrown open and given in charge to Mizuno Iki no Kami. At last, Kotsuke no Suke began to feel that the death of his wife and his own present misfortunes were a just retribution for the death of Sogoro and his wife and children, and he was as one awakened from a dream. Then night and morning, in his repentance, he offered up prayers to the sainted spirit of the dead farmer, and acknowledged and bewailed his crime, vowing that if his family were spared from ruin and re-established, intercession should be made at the court of the Mikado, at Kyoto, on behalf of the spirit of Sogoro, so that being worshipped with even greater honors than before, his name should be handed down to all generations. In consequence of this, it happened that the spirit of Sogoro, having relaxed in its vindictiveness, and having ceased to persecute the house of Hota, in the first month of the fourth year of Keian, Kotsuke no Suke received the summons from the shogun, and having been forgiven, was made lord of the castle of Matsuyama in the province of Dewa, with a revenue of 20,000 kokus. In the same year, on the twentieth day of the fourth month, the shogun, Prince Iemitsu, was pleased to depart this life at the age of forty-eight, and whether by the forgiving spirit of the prince, or by the divine interposition of the sainted Sogoro, Kotsuke no Suke was promoted to the castle of Utsunomiya, in the province of Shimotsuke, with a revenue of eighty thousand kokus, and his name was changed to Hotahida no Kami. He also received again his original castle of Sakura, with a revenue of 20,000 kokus, so that there can be no doubt that the saint was befriending him. In return for these favors, the shrine of Sogoro was made as beautiful as a gem. It is needless to say how many of the peasants of the estate flocked to the shrine. Any good luck that might befall the people was ascribed to it, and night and day the devout worshipped at it. Here follows a copy of the petition which Sogoro presented to the shogun. We, the elders of the hundred and thirty-six villages of the district of Chiba, in the province of Shimosa, and of the district of Buji, in the province of Kadzusa, most reverently offer up this our humble petition. When our former lord Doi Shosho was transferred to another castle in the ninth year of the period Kanye, Hotakaga no Kami became lord of the castle of Sakura, and in the seventeenth year of the same period, my lord Kotsuke no Suke succeeded him. Since that time, the taxes laid upon us have been raised in the proportion of one to and two sho to each koku. Item. At the present time, taxes are raised on 19 of our articles of produce, whereas our former lord only required that we should furnish him with pulse and sesame, for which he paid in rice. Item. Not only are we not paid now for our produce, but if it is not given in to the day, we are driven and goaded by the officials. And if there be any further delay, we are manacled and severely reprimanded, so that if our own crops fail, 
we have to buy produce from other districts and are pushed to the utmost extremity of affliction. Item. We have over and over again prayed to be relieved from these burdens, but our petitions are not received. The people are reduced to poverty, so that it is hard for them to live under such grievous taxation. Often they have tried to sell the land which they till, but none can be found to buy. So they have sometimes given over their land to the village authorities, and fled with their wives to other provinces, and 730 men or more have been reduced to begging. 185 houses have fallen into ruins. Land producing 7,000 kokus has been given up and remains untilled and eleven temples have fallen into decay in consequence of the ruin of those upon whom they depended. Besides this, the poverty-stricken farmers and women, having been obliged to take refuge in other provinces and having no abiding place, have been driven to evil courses and bring men to speak ill of their lord. And the village officials, being unable to keep order, are blamed and reproved. No attention has been paid to our repeated representations upon this point, so we were driven to petition the Goroju Kuze Yamato no Kami as he was on his way to the castle, but our petition was returned to us. And now, as a last resource, we tremblingly ventured to approach His Highness the Shogun in person. The first year of the period Shoho, 12th month, 20th day. The seals of the elders of the 136 villages. The Shogun at the time was Prince Iemitsu, the grandson of Ieyasu. He received the name Dayu In after his death. The Goroju at that time were Hota Kotsuke no Suke, Sakai Iwami no Kami, Inaba Mino no Kami, Kato Echio no Kami, Inoye Kawachi no Kami. The Wakadoshiyori, or Second Council, were Tori Wakasa no Kami, Tsuchiya Dewa no Kami, and Itakura Naize no Sho. The belief in ghosts appears to be as universal as that in the immortality of the soul upon which it depends. Both in China and Japan, the departing spirit is invested with the power of revisiting the earth and in a visible form, tormenting its enemies and haunting those places where the perishable part of it mourned and suffered. Haunted houses are slow to find tenants, for ghosts almost always come with revengeful intent. Indeed, the owners of such houses will almost pay men to live in them. Such is the dread which they inspire, and the anxiety to blot out the stigma. On a cold winter's night at Yedo, as I was sitting with a few Japanese friends, huddled round the imperfect heat of a brazier of charcoal, the conversation turned upon the story of Sogoro and upon ghostly apparitions in general. Many a weird tale was told that evening, and I noted down the three or four which follow, for the truth of which the narrators vouched with the utmost confidence. About ten years ago, there lived a fishmonger named Zenroku in the Mikawa Street at Kanda in Yedo. He was a poor man, living with his wife and one little boy. His wife fell sick and died, so he engaged an old woman to look after his boy while he himself went out to sell his fish. It happened one day that he and the other hucksters of his guild were gambling, and this coming to the ears of the authorities, they were all thrown into prison. Although their offense was in itself a light one, still they were kept for some time in durance while the matter was being investigated and Zenroku, owing to the damp and foul air of the prison, fell sick with fever. His little child, in the meantime, had been handed over by the authorities to the charge of the petty officers of the ward to which his father belonged, and was being well cared for, for Zenroku was known to be an honest fellow, and his fate excited much compassion. One night Zenroku, pale and emaciated, entered the house in which his boy was living and all the people joyfully congratulated him on his escape from jail. Why, we heard that you were sick in prison. This is indeed a joyful return. Then Zenroku thanked those who had taken care of the child, saying that he had returned secretly by the favor of his jailers that night, but that on the following day his offense would be remitted, and he should be able to take possession of his house again publicly, for that night he must return to the prison. With this, he begged those present to continue their good offices to his babe, and with a sad and reluctant expression of countenance, he left the house. On the following day, the officers of that ward were sent for by the prison authorities. They thought that they were summoned, that Zenroku might be handed back to them a free man, as he himself had said to them. But to their surprise, 
they were told that he had died the night before in prison, and were ordered to carry away his dead body for burial. Then they knew that they had seen Zenroku's ghost, and that when he said that he should be returned to them on the morrow, he had alluded to his corpse. So they buried him decently, and brought up a son who is alive to this day. The next story was told by a professor in the college at Yedo, and although it is not of so modern a date as the last, he stated it to be well authenticated, and one of general notoriety. About two hundred years ago, there was a chief of the police named Aoyama Shuzen, who lived in the street called Bancho at Yedo. His duty was to detect thieves and incendiaries. He was a cruel and violent man, without heart or compassion, and thought nothing of killing or torturing a man to gratify spite or revenge. This man Shuzen had in his house a servant maid called Okiku, the chrysanthemum, who had lived in the family since her childhood and was well acquainted with her master's temper. One day, Okiku accidentally broke one of a set of ten porcelain plates, upon which he set a high value. She knew that she would suffer for her carelessness, but she thought that if she concealed the matter, her punishment would be still more severe, so she went at once to her master's wife, and in fear and trembling confessed what she had done. When Shuzen came home and heard that one of his favorite plates was broken, he flew into a violent rage and took the girl to a cupboard, where he left her bound with cords, and every day cut off one of her fingers. Okiku, tightly bound and in agony, could not move, but at last she contrived to bite or cut the ropes asunder, and escaping into the garden, threw herself into a well, and was drowned. From that time forth, every night a voice was heard coming from the well, counting one, two, three, and so on up to nine, the number of plates that remained unbroken, and then when the tenth plate should have been counted, would come a burst of lamentation. The servants of the house, terrified at this, all left their master's service, until Shuzen, not having a single retainer left, was unable to perform his public duties, and when the officers of the government heard of this, he was dismissed from his office. At this time there was a famous priest, called Mikadzuki Shonin, of the temple Denzuin, who having been told of the affair, came one night to the house, and when the ghost began to count the plates, reproved the spirit, and by his prayers and admonitions, caused it to cease from troubling the living. The laying of the disturbed spirits appears to form one of the regular functions of the Buddhist priests. At least we find them playing a conspicuous part in almost every ghost story. About thirty years ago, there stood a house at Mitsume, in the Honjo of Yedo, which was said to be nightly visited by ghosts so that no man dared to live in it, and it remained untenanted on that account. However, a man called Miura Takeshi, a native of the province of Oshiu, who came to Yedo to set up in business as a fencing master, but was too poor to hire a house, hearing that there was a haunted house for which no tenant could be found, and that the owner would let any man live in it rent-free, said that he feared neither man nor devil, and obtained leave to occupy the house. So he hired a fencing room, in which he gave his lessons by day, and after midnight returned to the haunted house. One night his wife, who took charge of the house in his absence, was frightened by a fearful noise proceeding from a pond in the garden, and thinking that this certainly must be the ghost that she had heard so much about, she covered her head with the bedclothes and remained breathless with terror. When her husband came home, she told him what had happened, and on the following night he returned earlier than usual and waited for the ghostly noise. At the same time as before, a little after midnight, the same sound was heard, as though a gun had been fired inside the pond. Opening the shutters, he looked out, and saw something like a black cloud floating on the water, and in the cloud was the form of a bald man. Thinking that there must be some cause for this, he instituted careful inquiries, and learned that the former tenant some ten years previously had borrowed money from a blind shampooer, and being unable to pay the debt had murdered his creditor, who began to press him for his money, and had thrown his head into the pond. The fencing master accordingly collected his pupils and emptied the pond, and found a skull at the bottom of it. So he called in a priest and buried the skull in a temple, causing prayers to be offered up for the repose of the murdered man's soul. Thus the ghost was laid and appeared no more. The belief in curses hanging over families for generations 
is as common as that in ghosts and supernatural apparitions. There is a strange story of this nature in the house of Asai, belonging to the Hatamoto class. The ancestor of the present representative six generations ago had a certain concubine who was in love with a man who frequented the house and wished in her heart to marry him. But being a virtuous woman, she never thought of doing any evil deed. But the wife of my lord Asai was jealous of the girl and persuaded her husband that her rival in his affections had gone astray. When he heard this, he was very angry and beat her with a candlestick so that he put out her left eye. The girl, who had indignantly protested her innocence, finding herself so cruelly handled, pronounced a curse against the house, upon which her master, seizing the candlestick again, dashed out her brains and killed her. Shortly afterwards, my lord Asai lost his left eye and fell sick and died, and from the time forth to this day, it is said that the representatives of the house have all lost their left eyes at the age of forty, and shortly afterwards they have fallen sick and died at the same age as the cruel lord who killed his concubine. End of section 27